Good evening, everybody. How are you doing? Good to see everyone. Well, I'm going to wear two hats tonight. So my first hat is as the Dean and I will welcome you all to our first spring Zoomer. Although I got to say out my window, it does not look very springy yet, but um, hope will spring eternal. Um, so if you haven't been here before, I'll just um, ask you to mute while we're speaking. And then when we're uh, done with the with the sort of talk, we'll open it up for questions. And you can use either the chat um, to ask questions, or you can use, uh, you know, raise your hand and we can try to call on you. So uh, I'm going to um, go ahead and um, I'll introduce myself in terms of the, the talk tonight, and then I'll let Carrie Streeter introduce herself and then we'll get started. Um, and again, thanks for joining us. So um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Neva Spake. And um, before I was Dean, uh, I was in the history department as professor there. And about uh, in 2005, I had a chance uh, to do some work on the Kona State. And, um, and now that it's 2021, I'm still talking about it. And I will say that every, every year we learn more and more about the history of the Cones and their house in Blowing Rock and their house down in Greensboro and Baltimore and all over the place. And so um, it's been an adventure. And on most of this adventure, I have been accompanied by a Carrie Streeter who um, I'm gonna have her introduce herself and then we'll start um, about, you know, I don't know, probably 35, 40 minutes on the cones and um, the parkway, then, um, which the National Park Service that owns the estate. You know. yeah. so Carrie, you wanna introduce yeah. yourself? Sure, and I think I'll go ahead and just um, share this and by way of, uh, oh, boop. let me do that differently. <laughs> share it this way. Is that, do you all see this, the big screen now too? Okay, excellent. Um, I, this will be, this is the title of our talk, uh, Mansion on the Parkway, Moses Cone and the Politics of Public History. I've been working with Neva on um, researching the cone since I was a graduate student at App State um, in 2010. And um, I'm currently an instructor in the history department, I'm teaching US history courses. Um, while also finishing my PhD in US history. So at Neva's great encouragement after my work at App State, uh, my master's in public history there, I continued on and I'm finishing my um, doctoral degree at UC San Diego, but I'm writing here in Boom. So it is also not uh, sunny San Diego outside my window. Um, some of you may, I'm just gonna skip to here, but some of you may have seen these exhibitions um, last year. Um, this is something that Neva and I worked on at Brom, um, Blowing Rock Art History Museum. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, but I was one of the curators of that exhibition. So I've also continued doing work um, on the researching the cones over the past several years. All right, so Neva, do you want to? In fact, there's me on my first research trip <laughs> um, in the archives. Um, the work of doing history is um, a lot of uh, work with files and papers, and it's not very glamorous looking, but it sure was an, it was a tremendous experience for me to be able to, um, to you know, learn my craft um, through this project, working with Nita as a graduate student. So. So, um... Let me, I'll just back up a little and tell you kind of how this, this kind of unfolded that we both ended up uh, working on the cones. So in, in 2005, this was, like I said, my first kind of entree into the Cone Estate. Prior to that, I would visited the place. And d does everybody know where it is? Or have you been there? I, mean, I don't want to make an assumption, but um, it's a house that's located off the parkway near Blowing Rock. Um, and it was, um, it was owned and um, built by, um, uh, Moses and and um, and his wife Bertha in early uh, 20th century. So we'll tell you more about that. But I just wanted to, in case you hadn't been there, I want to give you some context. So um, I was asked by um, a group of people who were supportive of the Cone Estate to learn more about um, the furnishings inside inside the house um, when it was occupied by the by the Cone family, and so. Um, 
I worked with some uh, graduate students in the public history program and we began to do our initial research and that's how it started and then it sort of has um, continued over the over the years and then in 2010 um, I had a um, opportunity uh, through the National Park Service to do a furnishing study on the state and that's when Carrie was um, working with me. So she's going to start and talk a little about the family history and then we'll go on to some other things. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. I was just going to say one other thing. So really, um, we had kind of two goals for tonight. One is that we really want to think about the interpretive route that has happened over time with the Kona State. How did the Park Service, and even before the Park Service, how was the house seen by people? And how is it seen today? And then also, what can we do in the future to interpret how the house is um, visited and what it brings to the history of the area and to um, American history um, kind of um, more fully? Yeah. And they're, they're kind of a, a quintessential, um, well, they're really good American family to study for those questions. There's a lot, um, as Neva said, every time we come to the story, we learn something new about the family and about their role in the development of, um, of America in this time period. Um, so some of you that may have gone to these exhibitions last year, you got to see more about the family in Blowing Rock. And um, some of the more well-known um, Cone siblings are Dr. Clarabel and Miss Etta. This was definitely a feature of those exhibitions. Um, they collected over 600 works by Henri Matisse. And um, part of that, along with a lot of other modern art, um, and part of that art came to Blowing Rock last year, including this piece, um, Painter in the Olive Grove by Henri Matisse. Um, so this was definitely the star of those exhibitions, bringing that work it was to Blowing Rock, um, North Carolina, right up here in the mountains. Um, and it was the first time that really the collections of the sisters and the story of the family was told in one place. And so while the, the Matisse paintings worth millions of dollars were the star of the show for a lot of people, for Neva and I, one of the big um, stars of the show of those exhibitions was um, having a family member share this family album with us. And actually it was passed on from the descendant of one of the Cone sisters that no one ever hears about, um, the eldest um, sister here named Carrie. And we in particular, as we researched what is the story of this album and um, you know, why, what, what, why was it made? Um, well, for one, we loved that it was the first time we'd ever seen a, a photo of every sibling in the Cone family from the eldest, Moses at age 27, down to Fred age six. So their parents, Helen and Herman, had 13 children and 12 lived to adulthood. So that in itself was pretty remarkable. Um, but when we did a little more investigation, we learned the album was made, um, Carrie actually made it um, when she was getting married and moving to Marshalltown, Iowa, where her husband ran a clothing store. And we particularly found that lovely because Neva grew up in Marshalltown, Iowa. <laughs> so she knew something about that. So as you can tell, it's a, fan, it's a big family with lots of stories. And while we would really love to go into their stories in detail today, as Neva said, um, we're going to take you a little bit more behind the scenes into the story of um, the Park Service and their interpretive route. Um, and so we'll start off with this um, juxtaposition. OK, so this is a quiz. Um, there's, there is a right answer, but um, but don't worry if you don't get it. So looking at these two structures, how many of you think that the Cone Manor was built first? Anybody think that? Can we raise your hand if you think that's true. How many of you think the cabin was built first? Okay, yeah, all right. So I, I think more people think the cabin. So would you be surprised to find out that they were built approximately at the same time? <laughs> so one of the things that we're going to talk a little about is, is how is that possible? And when you have two structures that are so different, how do you make them fit in the same storyline of the, of the Blue Ridge Parkway? So we're going to come back to that, but I just want you to kind of keep that in mind as we move forward. So just a quick overview of the Kona State Flattop Manor, um, which you see there, um, and probably many of you have visited. 
was the summer home of Bertha and Moses Cohn. They're both children of Ger German Jewish immigrants. Um, they met at the Sociables Club of Baltimore and they were married by Rabbi Benjamin Zold in 1888. So the Cohn family was um, grocery wholesalers turned textile industrialists. Um, the fortune that built this house um, was made in textile mills in North Carolina. Um, by the time that they start buying property here, um, they're building what will become the largest um, denim and flannel mills in the world for a long period of time. Um, and so that's the fortune that builds uh, this mansion and this property. In 1901, when Flat Top Manor was completed, it was a 3,600 acre estate with 25 miles of carriage roads, which you can still walk on, right? Two lakes, apple orchards with over 30,000 young apple trees of 80 varieties. And the accomplishments, of course, made the news. There was nothing like this in the mountains um, around here at that time. Um, and in one of those reports, I found a fabulous statement. Moses Cone, looking out across the land, said, if there is an Elysian on earth, this is it. Uh, Elysian meaning the, you know, a phrase, the Grecian kind of phrase for heaven. So they definitely thought they were making a heaven on earth to where they hoped to live for many years together. But Moses actually died in 1908, so he actually didn't get to spend a lot of time here. And instead, um, Bertha continued to manage the estate from 1908 until her death in 1947, spending a lot of the summers here with her family, the Lindows. This is her with her sisters, kind of around the time she married. And then her nephew, whom she was very fond of, Norman and his wife at Flat Top Manor. Um, a lot of those later years would be, um, she would enjoy them tremendously with her grandnieces, Norman's daughters. And um, this is Judith and Nancy Lindau. They'll, we're gonna come back to them a little bit later because a lot of what we know about the Cones and the Lindaus and the house um, comes from uh, these two women themselves who spent their childhood there. And so just to give you this graph, I think it's helpful to see why we're talking about the park service. Um, as you can see, Moses and Bertha, they built the house. Moses lived in it for a short period of time. That's that blue um, box there. And then this purple area, right, which is the time that Bertha managed the estate. And Bertha actually gave the estate its name, the Moses H. Cone Memorial Park, but she never intended it to be part of the National Park Service. That decision was made by the trustees of the people whom she did give the, the estate to. Um, and that was the Moses H. Cone Memorial Hospital. Um, the, the agreement, and it's kind of complicated, but essentially the agreement was that they would manage this estate. <clears throat> Upon her death, the hospital, which built a hospital in his name in Greensboro, decided they would like to give the property to um, the National Park Service. And the Park Service agreed in 1949, um, it becomes property of the Park, Park Service, which was building the Blue Ridge Parkway. So for 69 years, right, actually longer than the Combs lived there themselves, Flat Top Manor has been under the management of the National Park Service. And today, actually over 250,000 people tour the house, though probably not last year, <laughs> I think it was closed. Well, it was open somewhat, but anyway, COVID year. Um, but still people definitely walk the carriage roads and it's one of the most visited sites on the Blue Ridge Parkway. So we will circle back to some more stories of the Cone and Lindau's at the end of our talk, but we're going to focus on that interpretive route in the stories of those other longtime residents, the National Park Service. So. So <clears throat> I don't know, some of you probably have seen these um shotgun rifle signs along the parkway. Um, this one is the one that's at the Kona State. And I think what's really interesting when you think about how history is produced and how you view history, these signs really give a, a mixed message about what, <laughs> what the Kona State is doing on the parkway. So um, if you look at the Cone Manor sign, the little brown sign here, you notice it's, it, it's telling you if you're driving along the parkway, you should pull over to see this little cabin with a with a pine tree. And so when you come down the, you know, the entrance and you get there and you realize it's this giant white house, there's a real disconnect there. Why is that? And so I want to talk a little about why that is and um, you know, what is what does it mean when you interpret a property in a certain way and what gets lost when you um, you only kind of have one way of lens of looking at something. So one of the things that we're going to be talking about um, is 
can you change the interpretation of a site um, and what does that take to be able to do that? And when you do that, does it open it up to a much broader way of talking about history, not just of the cones, but of, of the whole sort of time period? So um, I'm just gonna do a little history um, about the parkway. One of the things um, that when the parkway was being uh, discussed and then when it began to be built, um, the architect, landscape architect, um, whose name was Stanley Abbott, when he came down, he wanted to make an aesthetic that would echo um, Appalachia as it was being um, written about, which was a, a history of pioneer heritage of um, these hardy people. But there was also a mixed message in that, um, you know, in the late 19th and early 20th century that while they were hardy people, they were also poor, white and um, hillbillies. And so there was this kind of disconnect. Um, Stanley wanted to focus on, on, the, on the pioneer heritage on Appalachia and, and you know, what was, that was about uh, split rail fences, log cabins. Um, and so that was the aesthetic that he wanted to portray as they designed the parkway. Um, the parkway was built in stages. And so um, the first stage was built about where the Virginia North Carolina line was. That's the sort of started in 1935. Um, and it would take uh, years <laughs> for it to be completed. And if you're familiar with Lynn Cove Viaduct, that was the last piece that was completed. It was not completed in a linear fashion. They jumped around depending on where they could buy property and where they couldn't. Um, one of the things that um, happens in the 1940s is that the um, parkway is starting to get close to blowing rock and um, Bertha Cohn is well aware that um, they're looking at her estate as a place for the parkway to run through. Um, the reason she knows that is there were survey teams that were coming onto her property and putting up sticks. So she was well aware that this was uh, a chance that you know it was gonna be coming through. She was not happy about this um, and she was so unhappy about it that she wrote to um, a couple important people. One, she wrote to the Secretary of the Interior, Harold Ickes. And um, in that letter, she writes, what would Mr. Roosevelt say if you wanted to build a parkway through his front yard at Hyde Park? Um, and then later uh, she wrote to Mr. Roosevelt himself and she said, I am an old lady and I feel that after I die, changes are, a desi of, are desirable, of course. I will not be able to demur. Think of the road being made through your dear mother's home place on your own. Hundreds of trees and shrubs would be destroyed. And she invited Harold Ickes actually down to the estate to sit on her front porch and look out over this view here. And she's, you know, and, and convinced him that, you know, it really shouldn't be coming through her estate. So Ickes writes back and basically says, you know, she's going to put up a fight. She's not going to be here forever. Let's just not run it through the estate until after she dies, more or less. <laughs> And so <laughs> that's exactly what happened. And, you know, she passes away in 1947 and not long after the parkway was put through. Now they did build it behind the house instead of through her front yard. Um, and if you've been to the estate, if you walk past the carriage house and down, you go under a bridge and you go under the parkway. And so that the parkway really bisected um, the estate um, into two parts. And, uh, to, you don't you don't really think about it now, but that that's what um, that's what happened. At the same time, um, after she died, there's um, a decision is made about where the estate will go, and it's it has a lot to do with a 1911 uh, thing that happened after Moses died. But in the end, what happens is that um, National Park Service ends up getting the estate with a small uh, maintenance fee uh, that they can, or maintenance uh, budget that they can help keep the house up um, as they do that. Um, it was finalized in 1949. And at that point, the superintendent 
is thinking about what do you do with this property? I mean, there's a lot of wonderful trails, um, the carriage roads, about 26 miles of carriage roads, there's ponds, it's very quite, you know, quite lovely for uh, recreation. But then you have this house and it doesn't look like the houses that were the part of the aesthetic of the parkway, right? It is not a cabin in the woods. <laughs> and so he writes in 1949, as you can see, the house is not of material importance for its history or its architecture. It's interesting because the guy who used to own it was a blue jean and made his money in blue jeans, right? He was a, a, a wealthy man, but it's not very interesting. So what are we gonna do with it? And then he suggests three things, a concession for dining, a ranger headquarters, or some combination of the three things. So, we're kind of stuck in 1949. They're not sure what to do with it. And now Carrie's going to tell us what happens. Yeah. So um, the next question is, uh, you know, if the house does have no historic value, it's not something that it fits the Appalachian pioneer narrative. It's not a place where they actually want to interpret the history. Now, keep in mind at the time, uh, the, the blowing, the textile mills were still happening in Greensboro. Um, those, those Cone sisters that we hear so much about, um, uh, Edda was still alive. Um, people were not convinced about, some people appreciated their modern art collection, but even that was not, um, you know, so well known. So there's, there's some things that are going on that would maybe qualify them for to make that assessment. But essentially the house will become a venue um, for the park service uh, to do other things. And I love this photograph. These are park rangers in, um, in the azalea fields that were part of the front of the, the property. And they just kind of look in a quandary. <laughs> it's kind of fabulous. Um, and so what we're gonna see happen now from kind of the next many decades, um, Ann Wisnett, who's a historian of the Blue Ridge Parkway has this wonderful quote about kind of interpretive things that don't quite fit the mold, right? She says, no matter how obviously misshapen pieces that did not fit into the developing parkway scene were shoehorned into the Appalachian folk culture plan. Um, it's a great quote that describes what happened next, which was that by 1951, in a very kind of pragmatic move, right, if you're not going to interpret the history of the house and you don't want it to fall down, <laughs> um, you need someone to be there. And so the Southern Highland Craft Guild um, was looking for a place to demonstrate um, and sell their wares. So they actually move in and in the parlor that once had a piano and, um, you know, across from this parlor were some a Picasso and other things, but in this parlor, um, there will be a Pioneer Heritage Museum and uh, the Craft Guild will set up shop. They're still there, right? And operating um, in the facility to this day. Uh, it actually, pays the bills and keeps the house um, from not falling in on itself. So they're an important um, important resident in the house, so to say, right? Um, and so if we move forward though, we do see, see some signs of trying to start to interpret the house. Um, and so this is the first pamphlet that comes out in 1960. And you can see that the cones are not prominent. The story here that they're telling is, is it's a venue to hold this story of Appalachian history. Moses does make a small appearance. Um, he is just a persistent, um, you know, he's kind of described in ways that he's um, building, you know, he takes this, this undertaking took perseverance and decision and he hauled all this lumber up. This is kind of the only mention of the cones. Um, and so we're gonna see that uh, this, um, this 1960s, 1970s image of the Blue Ridge Parkway is still very much about providing Americans a rural retreat to some type of pristine American past, um, very deliberately appealing to white suburban America in this time period. And you'll see that in the next pamphlet that shows up in 1976. Here we get a little bit more information about the cones, but it's, it's, it's uh, told in a very particular way. Um, in this depiction, Moses Cone is a David, Henry David Thoreau. <laughs> I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, said David Thoreau in his years at Walden Pond, right? And some 50 years later at the turn of the century, you know, here we have a quote unquote Moses Cone wanting to live deliberately. He's a businessman, nature lover, and perfectionist. Um, some of those things probably are true about Moses Cone, but I think 
Mieben, I would make the argument, he's no Henry David Thoreau. And in this um, pamphlet, we do get a little bit of a nod to Bertha, right? Remember, she's actually managing the estate for most of the time that um, the Cones live there. Um, and, but in this depiction, her, her arrival is just as a woman who enjoys the views. Um, of, from the porch. So there's not really her story. Um, her, his brother, uh, Caesar, is depicted there, and we get Dr. Clarabel. So a nod to a couple others, but the family is still not central in the story. So um, the 50th anniversary comes along for the Blue Ridge Parkway, um, and Blowing Rock as a, as a destination um, in the the chamber and uh, sort of boosters see now that the parkway and the estate may be a draw for tourists and so there's not a whole lot known um, about the cone estate because it's always been dismissed because it didn't really fit into the narrative so you start to see a number of reports being done um, first one by uh, Barry Buxton in 1987. This is really the first time that anybody has taken a look at the history of the cones um, in, a, in a substantial way. And when I was beginning my research, this was the report that I found first. And um, there's a lot of good information in here. It sort of uh, whets your appetite, but it, you know, it's not, it's not that in depth. And so this was our starting point. And um, they also, in 1987, were the first time they did um, HABs drawings, which are historic architectural drawings of the estate. And before that, it had not been documented. So that was important. And then um, they use those uh, drawings and the information from Buxton's report to first try to nominate um, the house. And in the historic structure report, the house had been described as a Victorian neo-colonial with gables and Tiffany windows. Um, this was the first place and first time that it's really been described architecturally um, in any kind of report. And I want you to keep this in mind as Carrie sort of tells why these, this is important and um, how it can really impact how the house is interpreted in the future. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's not an unreasonable depiction of this house, Victorian, neo-colonial. There's, when you go into it, there's colonial elements on the columns and, are, you know, um, little motifs around the fireplaces. There definitely were not any Tiffany windows there, <laughs> just so you know. Um, Louise Tiffany, the, the famous um, stained glass guy, you know, he's not, he did not make any windows for the house. But so it's kind of, this is not a professional assessment, actually, this Victorian neo-colonial is just kind of, a, kind of anecdotal, maybe, you know, depiction of it. And these architectural labels um, actually are important because they do serve as frameworks for interpretation. Um, and this first report in 18, 1987, and this idea that it's a neo-colonial house will actually kind of have a long-standing impact. On the next report um, in 1993, which is commissioned um, by the Park Service, and Ian Firth, who produces this report, is a landscape architect. And he's, he's, this is an excellent report to kind of definitely looks at the house, but is more interested in the land. Um, and, the, and it places the development of this estate in this era called the country place era. Um, which means that it's going to emphasize a lot of um, the comparisons between Flat Top Manor, Blowing Rock, and another very large, very different estate over in Asheville, um, built by George Vanderbilt, right? Built, built more. Um, but in this country place era, right, of, of the rise of urban and industrial um, wealth at the end of the 19th century, uh, this gilded age, right, you did see people like Moses Cohn <laughs> um, moving to country um, or building these country estates for health and for um, kind of pleasure grounds. Um, but this comparison between, uh, between the house as a colonial revival and between uh, Moses Cohn and George Vanderbilt, which come from very different kinds of wealth, will get really overplayed. Um, and it will kind of drive the next, um, uh, a really important work that um, by Phil Noblet, who was actually a master's student here at App State, um, he wrote his master's thesis, uh, a very tremendous work, a lot of research. He worked with archives that no one had ever looked at before um, and really brought a lot together on the story of the Combs. It's the first publication on Moses and Bertha and their family. 
Um, but he'll work under this idea that it is a colonial revival house and that in some way the, that, um, that the German Jewish um, aspect of the Cone's identity um, is not is something that they were trying to escape from. And indeed the house in this sense then is kind of a shelter where they could hide their immigrant heritage. As he puts it, um, it would be a show place in the mountains, one that allowed this immigrant son to display his hard won wealth and cultivation, surround himself with symbols of colonial America and live like an antebellum aristocrat. At Blowing Rock, no one would ever be able to see that Moses Cone was anything other than a long established native born American. And I would say of all the things, and Neva and I, you know, as we move forward, we sometimes are critical, right, of, of this interpretation. Um, that is the work of histor history, is to look at why um, narratives exist and what might not be fit, what might not fit about it. So I will come back around to this in terms of how the evidence doesn't really hold or bear out this kind of assessment that Moses and Bertha were kind of running away from their German Jewish heritage when they were at Flat Top Manor. Um, and we'll see that actually in an important way. Um, one of the things that helped us rethink this story was this next report that actually came out around the same year. And this was the first time that a professional architectural firm um, examined the house and they made a really important distinction. And they said, it's not a colonial revival house as it had become known as, um, it was a Beaux-Arts home. And so we're in, a, we're in the weeds here a little bit with these architectural designations. But when we saw that, that these architects said, oh, this is a Beaux-Arts home, it really helped us broaden our interpretive framework. So Beaux-Arts was a popular architectural style um, at the Chicago World's Fair. And it brought together all these emblems and symbols and art from the past, specifically these Grecian and colonial references, and kind of in an eclectic way was very forward looking, very kind of imperial looking. Um, but it was, a, it was an architectural style for the celebration of the industrial age, meant to be modern, even as it made all these references to the past. And this really fit the cones. Um, they, they went to the Chicago World's Fair. Um, we know actually Bertha um, went to interview some of the very prominent architects of the Chicago World's Fair. Um, they ended up hiring an architect that was um, in Greensboro, had a, it didn't cost as much, um, but this fit, this fit them. And so this designation let us start widening our interpretive lens of the family. And as we like to put it, it encouraged us to start looking at the evidence and make an interpretive U-turn. And so by this point that Neve and I are working on this in the 2000s, so much work had been done, right? We had a lot to look at um, before all these reports, this book. Um, and certainly um, by, by that point, we're a long distance away from that 1949 designation that the house has no historic value. But if we're going to decide what, that it does have value and we want to tell the story of the family, well, what story should we tell? And so we get to that, we get to kind of this moment at which we come into the research. Do you want to <laughs> go ahead? No, um, uh, I, I think I spoke about the fact that we were approached um, in, uh, I think in 2005, I had a class and the students who were working on that class, um, one of the things that kept popping up was that they were realizing that the cones um, were Jewish and um, and that nobody was even mentioning that um, in the interpretation or on tours or anything. And the other thing that they really um, pushed back on was the fact that Bertha, for most of the time that she is discussed in any of the reports or any of the history, um, was often um, portrayed as somebody who was just carrying on Moses's vision, um, that she really had no autonomy of her own um, and wasn't making decisions. And pretty quickly, it, you know, as you start to dig into the, uh, the archives and into the historic record, it becomes really clear that those things were not true. Um, you know, the, um, the cones were not running away from their, um, from their religion. Um, Bertha was making lots of decisions. Um, and there's some great letters that I can talk about later, but um, it's, it's very clear that she was not just doing what Moses 
had wanted and and she had was making she had her own mind so um that was i mean it was exciting um and so by the time we get to writing the furnishing report for the house um, we're able to discuss a number of things that had not been discussed about the cones before including um their jewish heritage um the fact that that when um, they left blowing rock at the end of the summer they didn't go into a box but they actually went back to baltimore where they had another whole life right so um it often seemed like um that when they were in blowing rock we knew about them but afterwards you knew nothing about them where did they go when they left blowing rock for the season and went back wherever they went so we talked about that and um, we were able to interview her two grandnieces, um, Judith and Nancy Lindau. And um, I was, they were love, they were, they're lovely. And they had memories that you could not believe. They knew they could talk about the house and the foods they ate and who was at the dinner table. And um, they were amazing. And I did two interviews with them. And then Carrie was able to do a few years later, additional interviews. And so, we owe so much to Nancy and Judith because of their um, fantastic memories and just delightful women. And we also, oh, so we filled our furnishings report with um, details about birth from Bertha's will. She was very deliberate in describing who she wanted items to go to. Um, and from those visits, we also um, were given a vision of the first time we've ever seen the interior of the house in any kind of historic photographs. Um, and so this is Sophie's bedroom up here, one of uh, Bertha's sisters who lived with her for many years at the house, and um, Nancy Lindo at her desk. So we got a sense of what was in the house when Bertha was there. Um, and so we did get to start um, imagining new directions, right? Filling this house with new stories. and. Um, and pushing back on some of those things. So I thought of the ways that it had been told all along. So I thought I'd close up just by talking about some of the, if we ask, you know, what history do we see by widening the lens? Um, we get to definitely know Moses and Bertha more as individuals. And this is a photograph that Nancy and Judith shared with us as well. There are images, um, photographs taken of them as a young couple, not long after they married. Um, they spent actually a lot of time in New York City as Moses was building, um, shifting the family's business from grocery to um, textile. And we quite love Bertha's big puffy sleeves in this, right? <laughs> photo, photo, she's much smaller in a way than Moses. Uh, it kind of looks awkward, but if they're a you know, kind of a um, marriage photo in a way, um, she, deli she wanted the photographer to get those sleeves in. Um, so that's kind of fun. So one of the things we would say is that the evidence, you know, really tells us that the Cones and Lindows did not see their Jewish um, and American identities as contradictory. Um, this is actually the street that where they lived in Baltimore um, and where they met. Um, it's a street called Utah Place and it has these very large um, beautiful synagogues on either end. It was the wealthy German Jewish neighborhood of Baltimore. And uh, around the time, or late 1800s, um, that community put up this monument to Francis Scott Key right in front of one of these synagogues. And I think that this, you know, if you, if you broaden the lens of an American identity, it, it's important to recognize that one could be Jewish and American, that they didn't see these as contradictory identities. Um, and then the other thing we would say is that the evidence tells us that it's not really a rags to riches story as it often got told. Um, Moses definitely um, builds the family business from um, something that is successful. There's his father pictured there um, on this cigar box when they are um, H. Conan sons. Um, but even though his father came over from Germany with, you know, with, as, with, not with a lot of wealth, he certainly was well connected. And so to tell the story of the rise of the wealth of the Combs is to also place their story better into, you know, the advantages that they had through their German Jewish business connections and to recognize that um, their ability to kind of raise capital and invest in textiles was heavily related to the political and labor conditions that made industrial capitalism possible in the South after the Civil War. And so 
um, Moses Cone is kind of a Horatio Algier doesn't quite work, right? The other, other thing that doesn't work so great is that this Cone Vanderbilt connection, which is a little too narrow. Um, it places certainly these two very prominent wealthy men in North Carolina at the same time, but better comparisons can actually be made between Cone himself and um, the other people that lived on his street in Baltimore. Um, these are pictures from that Utah Place neighborhood. And um, many of the families that lived on that street had had similar stories. They'd started out as grocery wholesalers. Many of them had entered clothing or textiles and made their fortunes and also had their own country place estates, but probably more like in Maryland. Um, but I think the other reason why that comparison to Vanderbilt doesn't work is there's a better comparison between the siblings themselves. So um, the first Cone brother to build a mansion is actually um, Caesar Cone, Moses's young second, the second eldest brother, and he builds this house near the textile factories in Greensboro. And among the family, it was called the first Cone Mansion. Um, his niece in Asheville, who lived near Asheville Cotton Mills, um, also gave us this great comparison in the scrapbook. I found this <laughs> last year too, where she says. This is, she's got a picture of Vander, or Biltmore there under, and then underneath it, it says how the other half lives, <laughs> right? So the Cones were wealthy, but they were never Vanderbilt wealth. And then we would say too, Moses Cone was indeed an industrialist who went to the mountains for health and recreation, but he, as we said, is no Henry David Thoreau, right? Although himself, he decided, um, he did, he did really like uh, the appeal of the country life. And we quite enjoyed learning that this is the painting that he had over the mantel place in the dining room. This is Benjamin Franklin in the court of Paris, a very popular lithograph at the time. And this detail even makes more sense when you look at Moses Cone's passport in 1906, his health was not wonderful. And so the idea was to go for a travel um, to gain his health. And when he creates, when he fills out his ap application or his passport, you can see there that by this time though, he owns you know, the largest denim mill in the world, he lists his occupation as farmer. So this is a definite, um, you know, he, he comes by it honestly, right? He'd been building or planting all these um, 30,000 trees but this is a persona that he'll quite enjoy donning. And, and, and kind of in a Franklin-ish um, fashion, um, he will invest in public education in this period. So as you know, um, as, as alumni of App State, you should know that Moses Cone gave a really important first donation, early donation to the training school. $500 was a lot of money then. Um, he also builds a school in, for the estates, the children of the people who worked on his estate. Um, and it's still there. Uh, it was called Sandy Flat at the time. It, it was a school for many, many years. And um, it now is a Baptist church. Um, so he will go abroad and he'll travel. And there's that whole story to tell at the house, right? Um, his, what he sees in the world, what he sees with his sisters. This is one of the only photographs we have of Moses, Bertha, Clarabelle, and Etta. Here they are in, in, um, in India, as far as we know it. <laughs> it's a little hard to tell through all of the records, but um, one of the things that Etta writes back to her friends, the Steins, Gertrude Stein in particular, um, is that on this trip, um, Moses and Dr. Clarabelle um, were drinking in all this information wholesale in all the temples and tombs. So we know for Moses, this trip is quite meaningful to him and he'll actually come back to Blowing Rock and tell those students about what he saw out in the world. Um, these are just some of the stories, right? And, and as we also did more research last year on the art in the home, we were able to see that some of those things he brings back from his trip, um, he, like Etta and Clarabelle, became interested in modern art, and so did Bertha. And so up in the halls of Flat Top Manor, they had some of the same works of art that Etta and Clarabelle would later um, display in their own homes, and that the Steins that would, um, these collectors of avant-garde Parisian art would have in their homes. Um, also, Etta would give um, Bertha one of the Picasso drawings that she had purchased in 1906 from the artist. Um, himself, and he's not famous at the time, but Bertha um, put this portrait, a uh, woman with loaves, it was a draft sketch, right? Um, she would place it in the library next to some statues that she bought on the world trip. Um, these are gallery um, heads, and they're a depiction of the goddess poverty, which is a 
uh, Hindu um, goddess of domesticity. So kind of, this is the vibe. There's a lot more, there's a lot more to the story as you can see and a lot more to Bertha. So, you know, I got really frustrated when I first read that um, Bertha really didn't play a big role. And I just couldn't figure that out when Moses had died in 1908 and she doesn't die until 1947 and the estate somehow carries on. So that was been, uh, for me, one of the, the stories I really enjoyed telling. Um, the, you know, the first thing she did after Moses died um, was to expand the kitchen of the estate, which I thought was very telling. Um, and she was also not afraid to um, direct her uh, workers on everything from um, needing to take care of the wild dogs. She agreed to send a gun so that they could take the dogs out so they wouldn't kill her sheep. Um, to writing to extension agents about what's the best spray for the apples and making sure that the apples are looking great so that she could sell them. So she was um, she was very uh, on top of what was going on in the estate, whether she was there in Baltimore. Um, she built a dairy um, that produced grade A uh, butter and milk, and she sold that um, and also would take uh, have it sent to her in Baltimore um, while she was um, when she was not living on the estate. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, I, I think her story is very interesting. And then the other part of that story that I think is important um, is the workers themselves. Um, 30 families lived on the estate um, and did most of the outdoor work. And um, the African-American um, domestic help came usually either from Baltimore early on and then later, from um, HCBUs and um, uh, HBCUs in, in North Carolina. Um, the, the man in the center of this picture is Ed Bumpus and he was her chauffeur. He was from Baltimore. And, um, and one of the things I think is really interesting to think about with Ed um, is that she would get on the train from Baltimore to come down to Hickory. And his job was to um, leave Baltimore and drive overnight to be able to be in Hickory when she got there. And if you think about the times in which this is happening, so in the 1930s, um, you know, for a, an African American man to have to drive, even if he was a chauffeur, and even if he was driving, um, you know, somebody, you know, her car, you know, there was no place for him to stop to get food or any of these things. So, you know, there's a lot of stories that we can tell about the workers and the people who worked for the cones that I think are also opened up by the new interpretation that we have been working on. Yeah. And then, oh, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> sorry. Um, and then, you know, finally, um, you know, the Cones owned um, three of the largest textile mills um, in the world. And so the labor that was used <laughs> that to make those textiles is really important. And so, you know, thinking about who were their laborers, what kind of world did they live in? How did the Cones treat their workers? Um, you know, what did the cones do to support the, you know, capitalism and, and the growth of their mills? I think those are all other stories that also are, are important to the overall interpretation of the estate. Yeah. And so we just come back, you know, we, we, Neva and I look at this work and, you know, actually Appalachian State um, has had a long um, contribution, right, to the, to the labor that actually produces our ability to tell these stories of what goes into, you know, what we know about the family and what interpretation um, is makes sense in this space. But this question will endure long beyond us, right? What histories will we tell here? And um, we think, you know, Flat Top Manor really is a space um, that invites contemplation about the complex histories of American identity, opportunity, and success. And even though Cone Manor was originally a misfit, right, as we've talked about it, something that had to kind of shoehorn into that Appalachian quote unquote view of the Blue Ridge Parkway for the last 60 years, today, that misfit actually, the, the Blue Ridge Parkway brings these stories together in some really important um, ways, right, that we can see that these developments are happening at the same time. Um, and that there's indeed a lot to this story and a lot for us to learn about ourselves by learning more about it. Um, and so with that, um, we end our talk and we welcome questions. I'll stop sharing here. And it's gotten dark since the 
my room has gotten a lot darker. since the, the sun's going down. <laughs> so. I'm in Greensboro and we now have um, Revolution Mill, which is one of the cone mills where they, they, um, they, they manufactured cotton into denim. Um, that is now an, a giant apartment complex. And also there's um, a restaurant there, maybe one or two restaurants. It's just been a phenomenal opportunity to see those historic buildings become something else and renovated and they're just fabulous. So, I, you know, I think what you're describing here about kind of um, excluding the cone history, you know, during the 40s to about the 70s, it sounds almost like reverse snobbery to me. It's kind of like, you know, it's kind of ironic, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 And some of the things that we now view as history hadn't happened yet. I mean, Cone Mills was still operating and, um, you know, all of that was still ongoing. So I can kind of sympathize with their assessment, even as it's, it becomes kind of problematic, you know. But um, it was also, you know, the Cone, Bertha certainly never intended it it's not a house that was ever intended to be interpreted. It wasn't, you know, that the, the family's not, that's not their goal. That's not the end game for them. So um, that's also in the mix. <laughs> Grace, you, you guys had a question? Yeah. Yeah, this is John Nemeth and Grace Tony Edwards. Uh, we're Appalachian alum uh, from the mm, 60s. Uh, <laughs> I remember when I graduated from Appalachia and went to Greensboro, taught at Northeast Guilford High School, and the Cone family was absolutely dominant in that eastern part of Greensboro and on out into Guilford County. A huge employer is very important. But you know, there's a, there's a, your work is, is absolutely fascinating, but there's also a sub history that I'm familiar with. Uh, and the, the Cone Estate. Although you can't see, really you can't see the Brown Mountain lights from the, from the parking area. Many a young lady was lured to that parking lot <laughs> to see the Brown Mountain lights. <laughs> uh, and I'm sure, well, I'm not sure anymore. Things have liberalized quite a bit, but uh, at any rate, uh, if you didn't see the Brown Mountain Lights, you might look for submarine races. <laughs> In the lake? <laughs> That's anywhere, anywhere you could imagine. <laughs> um, what's interesting about, you know, when you talk to some of the people who have interpreted at the house over the years, they have some pretty, um, imp you know, pretty cool ghost stories about things that have happened there. And so... Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there are, I guess, with any, with any house, there's always a, a ghost story or two. So a lot of lore, <laughs> a lot of lore indeed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So has anyone noticed the sign that they have um, when you go out onto the trails that it says for your children not to play with the dirt because arsenic was used as a pesticide? Yeah. And I was, I, I, you know, I, I work for a, um, a crop protection company. And so I had to laugh, you know, I've seen that many times and I took my kids there when they were little, but uh, I thought it was interesting that she was all worried about her apples and, and now we're still worried about our children picking up the dirt <laughs> where was, her apples were grown. <laughs> I know, and it was state of the art, actually. I mean, there's some really remarkable, um, to, to use arsenic as a, as a pesticide. Oh, um, in some of her magazines that she subscribed to for, you know, like Progressive Farmer and stuff, there's these full page advertisements from Sherman Williams, right, with your arsenic, um, with your arsenic <laughs> pesticide that goes in your sprayer. So that's what they thought was the best thing to use. But yes, it's one of the things that makes it a challenging, it, it, it's one of the reasons why when there was a determination about what whether or not to revive the orchards that was, that did not happen. <laughs> I would so, guess um, not. One of the, there's a funny story about that too, because in the um, architectural report, one of the things they, they deduced from the, the the buying of certain chemicals was that she was painting her house every year and 
um, what it turned out was she wasn't painting her house every year. They were buying, those were some of the chemicals that were going into the sprayer. And so we, that was something that we were able to uh, do. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the Park Service does have a really wonderful collection of documents and ledgers um, and all sorts of things by which you can kind of get some of this information. There's a question here from Arlene. If they spent their summer at Flat Top and winter in Maryland, who managed the mills and did they spend time in Greensboro? Great question. Moses was actually always kind of more the salesman of the, of the partnership, so he never had a home in Greensboro. It's his brother, Caesar. Um, who built that first cone mansion and other brothers um, that also had homes in Greensboro and they managed the mills. So Moses, Moses was never kind of the day-to-day -day manager of the labor, that was his brothers. Um, and many of them are absolutely still in Greensboro. So the descendants uh, of Caesar and Bernard and Julius, um, they're, they're more of the Greensboro cones. And Vicki uh -huh. asked a question about the kids. So the Cones, uh, Moses and Bertha never had any children, um, but she was very close to her nephew, Norman. And they actually lived in the same house um, the, in Baltimore. So um, that's why she became very close to her grandnieces because they were Norman's um, daughters. And so they spent um, summers from the time they were about nine until they were um, went off to college. And so that's why they have I think um, such good memories about the house. Yeah, and um, Andrea points out that many of the cones in Greensboro support the arts. They absolutely do, and we didn't, you know, that we didn't get to believe us. We love to talk more about the cone and Lindell story, but we also thought this is a story that, even though it might feel a little bit on the dry side, no one, you don't really learn about the history of the telling of the interpretation, and it's kind of important to be thinking about that, right? We're all in a way. Um, especially since this is a property of the National Park Service, it is our, it's a place we're all stewards, right? And how we care for the support of this history is something we all have some responsibility for. So we thought you'd enjoy that part of the story. But yes, the Cones, um, I mean, they, they have been great supporters of the arts in um, Greensboro. And, um, you know, the, from the beginning, you've probably, I mean, they're the, uh, when Herman came over, the, the immigrant father, right, um, he came over with a directive from his own uncle that if he ever did become wealthy, that they, that their responsibility was to give back to the community. And um, they, the family will still refer to this letter, and it's a much more eloquently worded than I'm summarizing it here, but a commitment to philanthropy is a big part of their family history, both in the art and in the, um, in the hospital. Um, and um, yeah, there's there's a whole there's a lot more to talk about, right? With the labor history and um, capitalism and the mills and the reasons why the mills worked to come south and why they then left, um, you know, when they left um, when that labor goes to China. So there's a lot more to this story for sure. Um, yeah. There's also an overarching um, connection with Appalachian because there are so many Appalachian alumni in Greensboro yeah. and children that are at App now. So uh, there's a big connection with Greensboro. And so I think it's really lovely for Greensboro residents who are connected with Appalachian to further make that connection through the Flat Top Manor. And I know for me, that is one of the, when I go there, I try to go to Appalachian, um, Flat Top, and then Price Lake. Um, mm -hmm. Those are the places. And again, Price is also a Greensboro connection for me. So, you know, that's that's a wonderful a wonderful feeling. <laughs> I'm thinking of another Greensboro connection, Andrea, which is they hired some of the teachers that they would support to come to Sandy Flat and at the little the school in Blowing Rock were from the teachers college in Greensboro initially right um, and then um, I mean they were long the family is big supporters of education um, both Appalachian and in Greensboro so and of course we know they're valuing education Clara Bell becomes a doctor her other brother becomes a doctor another brother becomes a lawyer anyway <laughs> there's a lot <laughs> so yeah Yes, we could have a totally different talk just actually on the cones. <laughs> the There's a lot to learn about them and we're not even touching, you know, the art collection, which is a fun, fun, fun story. So what's going on with the upstairs of that building? Because I've been there many, many times and I would love to see that. Hmm. 
Um, but what, what is, you is can. there any, any plan to renovate? Do you guys have any idea about that? The park service, um, they have started upstairs tours and I don't, I think a lot of things kind of got halted last year with COVID. They're big, um, the Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation right now is um, a really key fundraising, um, you know, endeavor to uh, restore. It's badly in need of an exterior paint. <laughs> um, and so that's kind of a priority. And they also invested over a million dollars in putting a fire suppression system into the house um, in the past few years. So these are some of the steps that are going in place um, for them to be able to build a more robust interpretation um, or, you know, put, there's a lot of behind the scenes work going on, but they do in non-pandemic times offer, <laughs> offer upstairs tours and the um, tour guides have, there's, they've, they've been some of those that have also driven the interest in this broadened story because they want to be able to tell more about the family and uh, the workers. And so um, they, they're, they're excellent. <laughs> yeah. Does the upstairs still have some of the furniture pieces? No. Okay. No, so All the furniture went to the family. So. Yeah. And, and actually, um, we were very lucky that the the grand nieces had a number of things in there um, that they have um, that were original to the house. So we were able to see them and take pictures of them. So we know what was there. Mm -hmm. um, but then lots of things were, her, her will was 12 pages long and it detailed um, basically each piece in the, in the house and where it went to and to whom. And, um, and so that was when originally when we were working first on the furnishing plan, that was our, our map. Um, to what we were looking for. Mm -hmm. um, so that was <laughs> very useful. And, I, you know, the reason she spent so much time on her will is because when Moses died, he died without a will. And it caused quite a lot of turmoil for about three years as they tried to settle the estate. And I think for her, she wasn't going to have that happen on her watch. Yeah. 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 Well, you all mentioned like the people that worked there and this seems to be an ever going, you're finding new stories and new things to tell. What's the next thing you really want to work on or delve into <laughs> to add to all the knowledge you have? <laughs> um, I'll, I'll say, I'll say mine. There's a, there's a ledger at the Blue Ridge Parkway archives um, that is of the uh, workers of the apple orchard in the many years that Bertha managed it. And it would be a very, tedious project but a precisely type of project that makes sense for like students and such to work on which is to to transcribe that and find those folks in the census record and just really build out a better sense of the labor um, uh, of of those that are caring for that estate i know i found in one record like at one time bertha made the large she was successful in securing the largest commercial apple sale that had happened to date in North Carolina at that point, you know? So I think we have a lot more to learn um, and that particular record. I mean, they're just, I mean, they're like this wide and they're pages and pages of, um, of who was working there and what they got paid. And so that's one of the, that's one of the things I'd like to know more. I, there's a journal that was written by one of the overseers um, that I've now tra got transcribed, but I want to annotate, I think, um, because there's a lot of sort of inside trading information, but I think it would be uh, fun to try to, you know, and he, he talks about where they're planting and what they're planting and um, when, and, and, um, and the, the thing that's sort of interesting, um, you know, when Moses died, the apple trees weren't yet mature. Um, so while he had the 30,000 apple trees planted, he never reaped the harvest. And so it was really um, Bertha who did that. So I just think there's, there's kind of more of that, of that story to tell. Yeah. I could go on and on. <laughs> In my work for the art, for the art um, exhibitions, you know, I got to lo learn more about that part too. So there's a whole list of things, <laughs> uh, correspondence with the signs and all sorts of things. So anyway, <laughs> lots more to the story. Were there heirloom species of apples? Absolutely. And um, we have the names of all the apples. There were over 80 varieties and they're quite beautiful, um, uh, the variety of 
actually I, I showed a picture of the, some of the apples. Um, the, the USDA at this point in time is actually hiring artists to go around and illustrate apple varieties um, in the 1890s. So it was a big expansion of, you know, it was a way of, uh, we didn't mention this, but Moses actually um, gathered apples from the region and sent them to the Paris World's Fair in 1900. So he was, he was developing a world, a world demand for Western North Carolina apples um, before his own orchard was <laughs> ready for harvest. And he gets a prize. Um, the certificate is still at the, um, is at the archives. We had it on display at exhibitions, but yeah, there's definitely heirloom species. And um, actually, if you go to our, um, if you go to the farmers markets around here, a lot of the apples that um, are available at the farmers markets were one they once they would have grown. Um, so yeah, it's the apple story is such a fun story I think to look at. Really interesting. Tasty story too. <laughs> That's right. So if people wanted to learn more or know more about the cones in their own time, Carrie, this could be a plug for a book that I know you worked on. But are there certain publications you would recommend? Um, let's see. Well, we did produce the catalog and I think you can find it in the library. It's, it was a limited print run. So um, I think there is some copies at the special collections on campus um, and the Blowing Rock Art and History Museum might have some copies of that. There's some wonderful essays in there on that, you know, particularly about the cones in North Carolina. Um, and there's a lot about the Cone family that you can learn at Baltimore Museum of Art um, websites. So I'm trying, there is, um, Neva, help me out here. <laughs> there's a, um, the book by um, Carrie's daughter and- um, Oh, yes, Collecting at Full Tilt. That is an excellent book. That's about, um, I don't have my copy. About Edda and Clarabelle. About but Edda and Clarabelle. Mm -hmm. And then of course the work by, um, uh, another faculty member, um, Beth Davison, she's produced a documentary called The Denim Dynasty, and that really goes into the, the build, the, the, the industrial side of the story. And I think you can find that and watch it online for free. Um, she also did a wonderful, um, with students at App, actually, they built, industrial art students built a little theater that's now in the old dining room of Hot Top Manor. You can watch some films about the cones and one of them is also available online and I'm trying to remember if you, if you search Beth Davison and Cone Banner you're going to find it. Um, so there is some good, there's more work being done and um, Appalachian and has had a big role in producing that work for the Park Service. Yeah. I think the Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation also just did a virtual tour of Flat Top Manor as well. So if you go to their website um, Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation, you can go in and kind of zoom around and see different aspects of the house. Um, since you can't go in it, <laughs> that might be something to look at. You can right see now. the attic. The attic is one of the most beautiful parts of the house. It's the only, it's not plastered and it's all um, uh, yellow pine uh, wines, wainscoting. So it's, it's really beautiful. And that's actually in the virtual tour. So you can see yeah. um, the help I should have pulled together some links, but you all can get creative. <laughs> you can find it with a little search. And the attic is amazing. So, oh, any other questions? These were so great. Thank you for your attention, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And um, we are, uh, somebody's going to have to help me out. What are our next two dates? Well, I don't have the dates in front of me, but I know that we have one uh, with two English and interdisciplinary faculty that's going to be about um, Southern culture and food. And then we're going to have one about environmental um, sort of partnerships with Appalachian. We've got three different faculty um, that'll be speaking and we can share those dates with you. We could send a follow up email. So stay tuned and I hope we'll see you back uh, for another one of our spring Zoomers. So thanks, everybody. Have a good evening.